All right, thank you very much, Joe. Uh, great to have you here, Chris. My pleasure, happy to be here. And uh, just for everyone, we'll start, we're gonna run through some questions here, and then when we're done, there's gonna be questions from the floor, so please be thinking about things you might wanna ask. Um, Chris, if it's okay, I'm going to start by reading a passage from a story that you wrote, and you can respond to that. And I believe everyone will know the, uh, the article of which I'm speaking. When I first approached Oscar De La Hoya's Golden Boy promotions in April about taking on one of their Golden Boys, WBC super featherweight champion Juan Manuel Marquez, I was surprised by how willing they are to fly Marquez across the continent to step in the ring with a novice. That's a great idea, they said. When do you want to fight him? A week before the fight, Marquez's manager, Jamie Quintana? Quintana? Jaime. What's that? Jaime. Jaime Quintana sent me an email offering me three choices, a broken nose, a broken rib, or a black eye. I politely responded, none of the above. As I stood in my corner, a wave of panic overwhelmed me, a feeling that would have been worse had I known that my editor had approached uh, Quintana a few minutes before the fight and asked him if Juan knew to take it easy. I told him to, he said, but he said, I flew all the way out here, I'm gonna kick his ass. <laughs> What's worse, Quintana asked how, my editor how he wanted the fight to end, with me standing on my feet or lying flat on my back. Perhaps wondering how I was going to write with brain damage, he chose the former. So I'll ask you the first question, what is wrong with you? <laughs> there was like a, a two-year period where I thought it was a good idea to get involved with investigatory or participatory journalism. I don't know how many of you have read George Plimpton's stuff. Um, he was a big, big <laughs> idol of mine when I was younger uh, and just getting started in the business and all the stuff he did, he wrote Paper Lion, we tried it as a quarterback for the Lions. Um, he fought Archie, uh, Archie Moore. Um, that was kind of where I stole uh, that idea from. He wrote a whole book on, on that fight and I stole it from him. Um, that wasn't a good idea. Uh, I, got, I got him with them and I pretty much got my face beat in front of my 20 friends from Boston who decided to get drunk at 11.30 in the morning and just show up and <laughs> crash the whole thing. Uh, I don't know what, what was wrong with that. It, was, it seemed like a good idea at the time. And, I, and one part of that story that isn't in that text was the, the scariest part is you're sitting there, and I'm, in, I'm at this gym in the New York Health and Racket Club, and I've got, or New York uh, Sports Club, and I've got you know, a couple of guys who are training me, and he rolls in with his entourage of like 20. And, and if you ever watch a fight, you know, the guys that, he, that fighters walk to the ring with, he brought all of them with him to New York. And that was probably the most intimidating moment of the whole thing. So. In another first-person story, uh, you went to bull riding school, yep. right? Which seems insane. I mean, if the last one was crazy, this is this is this is you know diagnosable. Uh, you broke your collarbone, but more importantly, at the end of the story, you revealed that someone in your class was killed during the weekend. All of a the sudden, there seemed to be a self-revelation that this was serious business you were involved with. How did that experience that you went through as a participant and as a sports journalist change you as a writer? Well, it sure made me want to stop doing those kind of events. Um, the, you know, the guy in my class, uh, that bull, was a bull riding class, and again, this was sort of, a, I wanted to do all this participatory stuff. It's a bull riding class, and uh, I thought it was fun until I broke my collarbone. It was certainly tragic when the guy that was on the bull right after me, um, he was knocked under the bull and was killed right in front of me, in front of my eyes. And you know, something that immediately seemed like a good idea and fun suddenly became just maybe the most tragic event I've ever witnessed. Um, you know, it, how it changed me as a writer, I'm not really sure. I mean, I think it, it certainly stopped me from doing that kind of thing um, full time, but it, it was definitely an experience where you learn how to insert yourself into a story and, and try to make it interesting to the reader. Right, and that was the last first person story? That was the last one. My mother wouldn't talk to me for a month after I did that. <laughs> and uh, that was just bad. I mean, I, I did this stuff in part because of Plimpton, in part because I had a really big mouth in college. And uh, I remember when I, I used to work for the Celtics, I was a ball boy for 10 years. and. One of my first experiences there was I went one-on-one -on -one with Michael Jordan when he was with the Bulls. And it started with him walking off the court after one. So I was wearing a Duke t-shirt because everyone from Boston who was my age wanted to play for Duke back then. And he said, you know, he's a Carolina guy. He said, Duke sucks. And I said, you know what? You suck. <laughs> uh, so he, so he, he says, get over here. And we start playing one-on-one. -on -one. He didn't take it easy at all. He beat me 48 to nothing. Um, I got one shot off and it was blocked. I don't, to this day, I'll never forget that because I thought he'd let me get the shot off, and that wasn't happening. Yeah. So let's let's then let's go back to the beginning, since we're already starting there. You got your start as a locker room attendant for the Celtics, a team which we all hate. By the locker way, locker room attendant sounds way cooler than what uh, well, it, was. <laughs> it was. Ball boy, ball boy, <laughs> yeah. towel guy. All right, yeah. so you're, you're you're working for the Celtics. Right. So how did that happen, and what did that do to shape your career? 
I had a boss that um, he liked having cops' kids work for them. Um, I guess he got himself in a little bit of trouble pretty frequently. And my father was a Boston cop, and he liked having his whole staff of ball boys was Boston cops' care or cops' kids from the area. So he, you know, approached uh, someone approached my father and said, "You want someone to work for the team?" And he said, "Yeah." And I jumped in full bore, and it was, I mean, obviously it was a tremendous, ridiculously cool experience. I mean, when you're a kid, and I started, I think, at 13 or 14, and when you're a kid doing it, it's just fun chasing down rebounds and handing out water and stuff like that. You get to college, and, you know, some of these guys let you roll with you to them to the bar, and it's even better at that point. Um, so that, it was just a great experience overall doing that, but it also gave me some, in, like, uh, gave me some insight into how reporters interact with players and how, uh, what the right questions to ask were, what questions players were going to blow off. Because I was in the locker room before the press came in and I knew what the players were thinking about, certain reporters were thinking about certain questions. They would talk about it behind the closed doors that I would get to be behind. And it was, uh, it was definitely a, a learning experience just watching and observing what was going, the interaction between these two these two fields. So were you already an NBA junkie at that point, or that is that what did it for you? No, I mean, I, I was probably an NBA junkie when I was 13, but this, you know, definitely did it for me. <laughs> Unfortunately, I mean, the Celtics were good in 08. They were good in the 80s, but I don't know if anybody remembers the Celtics from the 90s, but they were brutal. And it was, you know, Rick Pitino, ML Carr. A lot of draft success. A lot of, a lot of high draft picks. Um, I remember I once intervened between a fight between ML Carr and D. Brown, um, where D threw a shoe at him that almost hit me. Um, it was it's, it's a surreal experience and a lot of fun, but uh, not good teams. Were you also a baseball fan? Yeah, I mean, you're, if you're from Boston, you support all those teams you know, blindly. Now, the other thing you did early in your career, which most people certainly at, at that point didn't do, was you wrote for the Boston Globe when you were still in college. How did that come to be? I had a friend that, uh, and I should start this by saying, I knew I wanted to be a, a journalist since I was 10 years old. My uncle... Um, was a beat writer for the Boston Herald. His name is Kevin Mannix, and he covered the Patriots for about 30 years. And I remember, even back when I'm 10, 11 years old, sitting there at Thanksgiving dinner and Christmas dinner and, and him talking about his relationship with Bill Parcells and being at um, a Super Bowl game and just, just being on the daily beat uh, of covering sports. And I just couldn't imagine there was any job that was, that was cooler than that. And, and so really from, from, from jump, I wanted to to do that job. And I got, again, a lot of it's luck. I mean, a lot of it's the stuff you fall into. I fell into the Celtics job and got lucky with that. And I had a friend that was working at the Globe as a, what they called there was called the Nighthawk role, where basically you answered the phones for them on a shift, but you also were the guy that wrote the high school stories, those 100 word to 250 word stories that got in the back of the paper that didn't matter much except that you got your byline attached to it, which was, you know, obviously the goal in those situations. My friend recommended me to the guy that was in charge of that position at the Globe, and I got started there um, and wound up doing two years uh, writing uh, sports for the Globe. And, and if you're, when you're about to graduate college, I mean, the best thing you could possibly have is, you know, bylines from a major newspaper like that, and, and certainly that was a big help to me. And so what, specifically, what, did you get any, any specific sports you got to cover? No, I mean, it was, I mean, one thing I tell people that, you know, like a crowd like this, like what, what the best advice would be, it's never say no. I mean, I, anywhere they wanted me to go, if it was, you know, freshman girls golf in a, the end of Massachusetts, three hours away, I was going. I was getting in the car, I was going, I was writing 75 words, I was turning around and I was going home. But it wasn't any specific beat there, it was just high school stuff. Like whatever they had room for and whatever they asked me to do it, I, I would always go. And so you started out, you know, as a young kid, and you're hanging out with NBA guys, and, and, and <laughs> which is, you know, not something that most people do. Clearly, you're, you're hanging out with guys up to and including Michael Jordan, and it's easy to get starstruck in that role. Mm -hmm. Now, Bill Simmons kind of made the I'm a fan and I'm also a writer kind of vogue, and that's something we'd never heard of before. But most sports organizations, sports journalism organizations, don't kind of adhere to that, that ethos, particularly Sports Illustrated, which has you know, a long tradition of, of, of quality sports journalism. How did you transition from being the kid who loved watching these basketball players to someone who was now covering them? Now, that was difficult. That was a little tricky at times because there were when you're in college and you're doing the stuff for these guys, I mean, I remember there was one guy, his name was Lee Nalon, I think he played in the NBA. And I don't know how familiar you are with the dynamic between like the locker room kids and the players, but anytime the road players saw girls in the crowd, they would tell the ball boy to go get the number. And I did that all the time, you know, because if I was successful, it wound up getting me a hundred bucks. 
Um, <laughs> so it's, you know, I do that all the time. And then when I, the first time I walked into a locker room with a press pass on, I couldn't tell you how many guys that knew me from the Celtic days, they had, their face just went white. That they were looking at me like, you're not going to write about all the stuff that, that you did for me back then. And, you know, it was, it was definitely a, a, a different transition for being their buddy and being someone that liked to just hang on and, and go to the bar with them and just hang out to, you know, being uh, someone that had to cover them and be critical of them uh, more often than not. Did you ever, have you had any particular conflicts of interest that you could talk about? Any, any story where you, you really had a hard time? It's always difficult to write about the Celtics sometimes because, I mean, Paul Pierce is still there. and He was there when I was with the team. And it's always a little tricky criticizing the team, not only just that you grew up being a huge fan of, but also you, when you worked for uh, for 10 years. Um, that, that's probably the most glaring example of it. I, I was always a little, now, now not so much. Now I'll just, I'll kill them if they deserve to be killed. But it, back then it was always a little bit of a slippery slope with me trying to cover that. So, uh, so you, you graduate from college, you've done locker room attendant, you've, uh, you've written for the Globe, and you get a job right out of school with SI. How does that happen, and what's the job you have? I, uh, I, a, a guy named Ian Thompson, who some of you might know, he writes for Sports Illustrated, covering the NBA, he was based out of Boston. And Ian was someone that I got to know pretty well when I was working for the Celtics. And as I was graduating, I, I basically took I picked up every magazine out there and found the masthead and basically carpet bombed the masthead with resumes. I would send every single editor on those mastheads resumes uh, with a cover sheet saying, I'll do anything. And I got some responses um, you know, from various, uh, various magazines. But SI was, was one of them because Ian placed a call and asked him to interview me. And SI at the time had a role for three months. It was you can basically come in and be a fact checker for three months, and then you're done. Um, and I jumped at it. I moved from Boston to New York. I moved to this horrendous apartment in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, that was probably the most disgusting thing anyone's ever seen. Um, I lived on an aero bed and watched Family Guy DVDs every single night before I went to bed, because that was the only form of entertainment uh, that I had. Uh, but I did that for three months. And what I did when I wasn't sleeping was go to the office and work every single hour I possibly could. I would offer to fact check the entire magazine. I would say, you know, golf, uh, swimming, tennis, whatever it was at the time, not just NBA stuff, I would do it. And progressively, they put me on one-month extensions. For about six months, I was on one-month extensions until finally they gave me an opportunity uh, to be on staff. But I would attribute it almost entirely to a, being willing to get up and move for three months. I mean, that was probably one of the toughest parts because there was a pretty good chance I was going to have to turn around in three months and move back into my parents' house. Um, but and B, just being willing to work 19 or 20 hours a day. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's almost as simple as that. If you, the thing that got me, got, caught their attention was my willingness to be there at all times. And for a fact checker like that, that was huge. Right. And was, did you feel when you were there, was it a competitive environment? Did you feel as if you're there, you're working, but you know there's two or three other kids who were there who want the same thing? Yeah, there was definitely that. But I think it, at SI, it wasn't you're competing with each other because SI would know if you were good, they were going to promote you. It wasn't like there was only X amount of spots available for writers. If you could write and you could do the job, um, they were going to give you an opportunity. And I think that's the same. I would guess that's the same thing in, in many uh, news professions, that if, if you can do the job, they'll create a spot for you. It's not, it's, it's not like they're going to uh, hold you back or, or want you to do less if you can do it. Um, and they've been, SI was great to me early on, you know, slowly moving me up the ranks, uh, teaching me things as I went along. And, uh, it really was incredibly helpful, especially not having to write right away. 